the speaker is, I'm looking at my notes, it's Charlotte. She's VP of Brand and Strategy. And her title, again, a really intriguing title, loads happening over the last couple of days, is how we use chaos theory to disrupt category. So without further ado, and don't forget to ask your questions on the app that I can put to her after her talk. Thank you very much. It's over to you. Thanks for having me. It's so great to uh, be here amongst so many uh, brilliant brands and agencies. And uh, if any of you have ever given a talk like this, you probably know that um, trying to come up with a title is quite anxiety inducing. And you might be looking at this one thinking, you know, reinventing an industry like that's a bit bold. And uh, certainly my imposter syndrome had me thinking the same thing uh, and uh, that we might be kind of getting too big for our boots. So. As an English grad, I went back to my trusty companion that has seen me through a ton of essays and now briefs and presentations, and I went back to the dictionary. And this is the definition of reinvent. To produce something new that is based on something that already exists. So maybe it's not that bold then. Just look at something that we've got, create something new, inspired by it. But there's a bit of magic in there too. Like, how do you get from that something old to the something new? And the dictionary, to be honest, isn't much help there. So I'm going to try and tell you what that magic is uh, for Bloom and Wild. So here we go. I'm going to start back at the back seven, eight years ago, uh, when before Bloom and Wild existed, and the flower industry uh, really was centered around Google because that was everyone's favorite online florist. And you probably had to make do with designs that weren't really to your taste, and, and maybe flowers that didn't last very long once they arrived. And pre-WhatsApp and Instagram, that was kind of OK. But as soon as people started uploading to Instagram all of their pics of their birthday presents and started WhatsApping you to say thanks with a picture of it, the pressure on gifting really ramped up. And so if we were going to create a brand, a flower brand to compete with Google, then, you know, yes, we needed to build a, an appealing visual world and a slicker interface that would make it really easy for people to order. But we also had to find a way, first of all, to unlock the quality issue because there were disappointing experiences going on all across the, the category. And second of all, ease of delivery, because that faff of having to work out if the person you're going to deliver to is going to be in when you want to send them was spoiling surprises up and down the country. And to do that, we had to fundamentally re-engineer the supply chain. And bear with me, I promise this is the only supply chain slide in this presentation. But I think it's worth saying that the standard flower supply chain is eight to 10 days. So it means it will take you eight to 10 days from the flower being cut in the field until it arrives with your recipient, which means that actually once it gets there, there's often not a lot of life left in them. And interrogating the supply chain left, led us to a really interesting finding, which is that at wholesale, flowers come flat packed. And that's because they're in bud, which also means that they're fresher. So we realized that we could solve the quality issue by sending flowers in bud, which also meant we could get them into a much smaller box to solve the delivery issue. And you might be wondering when I was going to come to collision theory. So here we go. It turns out that in order to uh, express how we're reinventing the industry at Bloom and Wild, I would have been much better off studying chemistry than English, because I think this is much more helpful. Collision theory tells us that when reactant molecules collide with sufficient energy, Bonds are broken and new bonds are formed to give products. So we collided together flowers with the uh, letterbox delivery mechanism that was being popularized at the time by brands like Grays. And with that, we created an entirely new format that hadn't been seen before and our brand USP. And these collisions I like to call them creative collisions, and I think they're creative because they're bigger than the sum of their parts. Because 
putting flowers together with a letterbox doesn't just give you letterbox flowers. It means that actually they arrive in bud and so our customers are taking pictures of them all throughout their journey from bud to bloom, which means that they are then sharing them with their family and they've got way more moments of interaction with our brand, but also between the sender and the recipient, who this is all really about. And what's really interesting is that once you remove the faff of it being a big flashy gesture that you have to know someone's going to be in to receive, it shifts the behavior of people in this category. And we really managed to scale an entire just because flower gifting uh, moment so it means that we're not a brand that's just reliant on Mother's Day, Valentine's Day, and the odd birthday. We have an entirely different shape to our customer behavior. And that was true even before COVID. Great weeks, shit weeks, ex-boyfriends, promotions, miscarriages, new girlfriends, miss you, loved seeing you. Our flowers are sent for them all. And with this principle of collision, we've even managed to shift behavior uh, around Christmas, which is normally a time of year you'd think of as having really fixed traditions. We collided our signature letterbox format with the Christmas tree and the tiny tree was born. And just like our original letterbox flowers created new just because gifting behavior, here we created a whole new category of Christmas gifting people sending to grannies and kiddies, students, those of us with tiny London flats, in the run-up to the festivities. It's like an advent calendar completely reimagined. And when it came to Mother's Day, the biggest occasion in any florist calendar, we collided compassion and tech in a way that hadn't been seen before. And it started when a few customers emailed us asking if they could pause their uh, emails from us around Mother's Day because they found it a really difficult time. And we took that and thought, well, maybe this is relevant to loads more people who just aren't saying anything. And so our tech team went away. They built the tech for a preference center so that people could opt out of those sensitive occasions. And our retention team took that data and segmented their email campaigns and opt out was born. And the response to our first opt-out email was mega. We were completely overwhelmed by it. We had hundreds of emails from our customers thanking us for our thoughtfulness. Uh, our Twitter traffic quadrupled. Um, it was picked up in the press, and it was even uh, mentioned in a debate in Parliament. And seeing the impact, we knew that we didn't want to stop there. So in 2020, our tech team built fully opted out website views. And also having seen other brands take on this practice, we thought, amazing, there's a real opportunity to scale this into a movement. And the thoughtful marketing movement now counts a whole host of brands who are committed to offering opt out. And we've also seen some mega brands taking part as well, like uh, Tesco, Boots and, and Delivery. So, Last summer, we were uh, working on our brand platform uh, with our agency other, you can see over there. And um, we thought really that there was a discrepancy between the way that the category was talking to customers and the way that our customers were interacting with our product and brand. All those just because moments that mark the highs, but also the lows in life, just weren't really being reflected. And so we collided that centuries-old emotion that is really, really connected with flower giving with an honesty that hadn't really been surfaced in this category before. And we flipped the focus that had traditionally been on the smiling recipient to the sender where that emotion all begins. And we didn't just tell people to make someone's day. We brought to life nuanced stories inspired by our customers across our creative as part of our Care Wildly brand platform. And then for Valentine's Day this year, we collided customer insight with uh, the prevailing norms that surround that occasion. And our hunch, we've got a problem with my mic. Yes, I'd just like you to move to the uh, left. Hand. Yeah, you can. Uh, Am I still going to be able to see anything? Let's see. Um, and our hunch that uh, our customers, and we call them care warriors, uh, who uh, might have really ap appreciated a bit more of a nuanced gift than the, than the cliche doesn't. And uh, 
what we found from research is that actually a, a bunch of red roses was the least favorite Valentine's Day gift. I guess I am that small. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and so what we did is we collided that insight with all of those cliches, and from that we created our Not For Sale campaign, and we, we took that leap that we wouldn't sell any red roses at all. I really can't say anything now. And uh, none of these reinventions would be possible without a culture that supports this, uh, this, this collisions and the energy that you need to make them happy happen. And that really makes our, our culture rest on three things. First of all, listening to our customers is really, really easy. So uh, every single piece of customer uh, research that we do is shared on our Slack channels, whether that be a piece of user testing or um, a major category study. But more importantly, every single employee sees customer feedback, good and bad, every single day through our Slack channels. And you don't need to set up a focus group. And whilst we've got you know, data that aggregates to tell us about quality issues on a particular stem, we will also listen to one or two customers who are selling us something, just like we did with opt-out. And in this flow of insight, our customer delight team are super important in funneling it into the right places. They don't just fix customer feedback, they champion it. And at our key peak times of year, a, a whole team forms part of the customer delight team. So this Mother's Day, I personally answered about 80 customers' queries, I think, and Aaron, our CEO, did hundreds. The second thing is that we're not afraid to do things that our customers haven't asked for. So our whole brand proposition is built around something that no one would ever have asked for, letterbox flowers. And so our ability to kind of solve problems creatively for our customers means that we've got a bit more confidence to do things that other brands might shy away from, like committing engineering resource to, uh, to building an opted-out website view, like not selling flowers, uh, red roses at Valentine's Day. And finally, we care wildly. So thinking back to that collision theory explainer, it told us that the, uh, the objects have to collide with sufficient energy for new products to be formed. And that energy is abounding everywhere in Bloom and Wild, from Aaron, our CEO and co-founder, running around London and measuring letterboxes when the business was first started, to Kerry, our supply chain lead, who personally checks all of the flowers coming into the warehouse at our peak times when they're gonna make up our bouquets for Mother's Day or whatever it might be, to Francesca in Customer Delight, calling an elderly customer just to check in. That wildly caring energy uh, is infectious and it's what fuels these creative collisions. So going back to my imposter syndrome about the title of this presentation, actually, on reflection, maybe it isn't too bold to say that Bloom and Wild are, are reinventing a category. And our repeated ability to collide together insight with fresh approaches fueled by that wildly caring energy is what's driving us forward in this category. And with a 22 billion pound opportunity in Europe, you can be sure that there is more to come. Thank you very much. So thank you so much. Great way to almost end the show today. So I think, again, we've seen a brand that's really doing things really different, and that's where your success has come from. Uh, putting the customer at the heart, but really putting the customer at the heart rather than just talking about it. So lots of questions, unsurprisingly. There's one here from, uh, I'm not quite sure, so that's, no, I can't even see the name. But it's how about your community? How do you look after and keep your community fed and watered? It's quite a sweet little asking question. Yeah. I guess we've seen so many brands on this stage talking about what a real community is, and obviously yeah. you do things very different. Yeah, I mean, I think it's not rocket science. You know, things like Instagram, we reply to every customer, we like their photos, you know, we, we get a lot of people sharing the pictures of their bouquets and with us 
just on Instagram and, and, we, and we comment on that. We say, oh, wow, that's lovely. What a great birthday present. Or I'm so pleased for you. Congratulations. Like we enter into those conversations with our customers. We think that's really important. And then the other way, our customer delight team is, is really key in building that community because you often find that people will, you might read it in reviews and say, actually, I left a one-star review, but then I spoke to the Bloomwell customer delight team and they were amazing. And now they've totally fixed it and I'm thrilled and I love this company. So that's a really important tool for us as well. And I didn't actually know that that opt out of opt out of delivery came from you. So that's very impressive. See everywhere now. A uh, question here from Helen who says, good question. What's the most important thing you've learned from your customers? Oh, what's the most important thing you've learned from your customers? Um, that these, that what we do, all of these reasons that they're sending flowers is individually important to them. So it might not be Mother's Day, it might not be you know, uh, Valentine's Day, but them sending their granny some flowers to say that I miss you is super important. And we all try and take that to heart and remember that every single day. You've still got time for questions, everyone, if you want to send them into the app. Uh, one here, which is nice from Shay as well, which sort of, sort of relates to the last one. What's the biggest challenge you face? And I'm going to add a bit to that. How do you get over it? Honestly, the biggest challenge we face, I've got two of my team over there, is like what we shouldn't do and deciding that because we are growing so fast and there is so much going on that you just can't focus on everything all the time. And so trying to apply that lens and find the right criteria to say, okay, do you know what? We are going to go all out on this, but we're, we're going to leave this one behind and it might feel a bit painful now, but it's the right thing to do for three years time. Excellent. Gareth, I love this question. I read once that essentially Bloom and Wild was a data company that sold flowers. Is this true? Huh. Uh, we have a very strong data arm. So um, I would, you know, it would be lying to say that that isn't a really strong focus. But really, though, uh, when I talk about, you know, we care wildly, that isn't just some bullshit that I'm telling you at a marketing presentation. I genuinely have never worked in a company with people who are so committed to what they're doing. They always give their all every single day and that they really care about what they're doing for customers. So, yes, we have excellent data, but we also have a, a heart that is, is driving us to do better every day. Excellent. Uh, nice one here from Sergio. It's clear that you guys, it's clear, uh, it's clear from the work you guys are doing with your existing customers, but what's the strategy around non-users of the brand? Yep, so um, last autumn we started um, brand advertising for the first time. So as a data-driven company, we'd been very strong in our performance marketing. So we are now going out and uh, investing a lot of money into brand-led TV and uh, other channels, online channels as well. And that will help us to really explode that awareness um, and consideration that will bring us in, in new customers. The other thing that we're doing is expanding out our categories. So we've just launched plants. Um, if you pick up a stylist next week, you will see them. Um, and so we're expanding out what we can offer people so that you know we're not just offering flowers if that's not what you want to send. I don't know if you want to answer this, but where next for Bloom and Wild's global expansion plans? Yeah, so we've um, we just recently acquired um, Bloomon, which is a Netherlands-based brand. So we've uh, we're in the middle of integrating them into the Bloom and Wild family at the moment. So that takes us uh, into eight European countries, and we are now the the largest operator in Europe. Um, so really, we're very super focused on making that a success and and bringing our companies together and knowing what we can learn from each other. So that's uh, that's where we're focused right now. Another hard one, which I should just not ask, but I'm going to ask, I think you can handle it. It's from Emma, who says, how is selling flowers sustainable for people and the planet? Where does the chain really start? And who does the revised supply chain cut out? Okay, so um, I'll start with the end and then go back. The revised supply chain actually cuts out the flower auction. So... Um, basically most flowers they go from the growers and then they go to an auction normally in, in the Netherlands and then you buy from there. So we have um, vertically integrated with our growers so we buy directly from our growers which cuts out a lot of time. In terms of sustainability, um, nothing we do, nothing we consume is 100% sustainable but we are doing uh, what we can to improve that. So um, last year, we mapped our carbon footprint for the first time, and we started offsetting all of our um, emissions and creating a plan to reduce them. 
We also know things that like, you know, actually are quite surprising that a bouquet of flowers only takes as much water as a cup of coffee, for example. So if you're a coffee drinker, you know, these are the kind of decisions. So it's not perfect, but we know what's going on. There's some really interesting um, uh, things that are like initiatives to grow flowers with less water, for example, by growing them in trays without any soil, which is really water efficient. Um, so yeah, you're right, it's not perfect. Nothing is 100% sustainable, but we're doing what we can. We're working on recyclability of our packaging. We're very committed to uh, zero waste as well. And you'll see from us some of those are uh, customer facing initiatives. So you might get an email from us saying, we've got our forecast slightly wrong this week, so here's an offer. Uh, which will help us make sure that we don't have any wasted this week. So it's something that's really top of mind for us and, and we're doing what we can and doing our best. Thank you. A uh, question here from Becky who asks, how important is social media in your overall marketing strategy? And we saw those amazing photos up on screen. So what's the role of social? Yeah, it's very important, both from a paid and organic point of view. Um, we built our business on, on paid social. Um, so obviously now our marketing mix is evolving, but it's still a really, really important engine of our business. And then from an organic point of view, um, especially our Instagram is really where our community lives. Um, and you'll see that we get great engagement on, on our posts and people really sharing insights with us too so at valentine's day we ask people you know what is what does you know non-cliched love look like to you and we got all these amazing stories from people like it's my husband creating me a veg patch or you know it's my wife having brought me a cup of tea every morning for 25 years and so they really engage with us in that sense so and that that gives us those insights as well that we can continue to create from I have to ask this really. Deborah, what's your favorite flower? Oh, that's a good question. Well, it's peony season, so at the minute it's peonies, um, which is really, oh, that's, a bit, that's a bit basic. But uh, the other one that's really cool is a celosia that looks like a brain, but it's very, it's very beautiful. Amazing. Now, I think we've only got time for, okay, I'm putting some more questions here. We've got time. Uh, this is one here from Scarlett. You run a lot of discounts, money off codes. How do these create value for you? Yeah, so we, we track that really, really carefully. Uh, and it's really important for us to be able to attribute our marketing so that we can uh, make sure that we're being as efficient as possible. Um, you know, they create value because it's a very discount-led category. So if we didn't offer any, then it would be really hard to get people into Bloom & Wild. But we, we take a very careful approach. Uh, you know, may not seem it, but we have a very data-driven approach to um, how we then use those. And we're really optimizing for the lifetime value of a customer. So it's really important to us that we, you know, if we get them in with a discount, that's fine. But then we're trying to optimize for the sort of multiple purchases over, over their lifetime with us. Perfect. One here from Dan who asks, you're building a really strong brand. How far can it go in terms of different products and categories? It's a live question, Dan. So I think, um, look, you don't want to go too fast, too far, too fast, because people will it, it will shake people, it will shake your customers, and they'll start to feel like they don't know what your brand is about anymore. But I think really easy for us to expand into plants as we're doing now. We're also working on um, a bigger vases range, for example. So there, there are some really close adjacencies that it makes sense to expand out. And then I think we'll take the lead from those adjacencies and how they perform as to where we go next uh, from there. Last question, probably quite a granular question. Any plans for personalized pics or text on your cards for any more personal experience? Uh, yes, you can already do that, in fact. So if you download our app, you can, I feel, I feel like I'm selling now. If you download our app, you can uh, upload your own picture for the gift card. And we love, uh, we love it when people do that. And they often get shared on Instagram and they bring us a lot of joy. Well, Charlotte, thank you so much. That was absolutely superb. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me.